Okay, everyone, just before we uh, continue with Justin's talk, uh, we've been requested by the organisers to advise that alcohol in the convention centre is not permitted. Some people have discovered that there are pubs on the site. So, no alcohol permitted uh, in the convention centre. Uh, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce a good friend and colleague, Justin, VK7TW, uh, who is not only Vice President of the Radio and Electronics Association, but also has a whole heap of cool toys. So, um, today he's going to talk about his high-performance SDR. Take it away, Justin. Thanks, Ben. Um, uh, let me push the right button. Okay, um, just very quickly what we're going to cover today uh, about the HPSDR. And I'm going to wend my way into the HPSDR, so um, just bear with me. Uh, a little bit about me, my SDR journey. I'm going to go through the SDR generations just as a bit of history as to how we've got to where we've got to. And I think it um, answers a few of the questions that were asked this morning about the RTL uh, dongles and a few other things. It gives you a bit of a where do they fit in the picture. Um, then move on to um, the HPSDR. Uh, some of the issues um, with SDRs and that particular type of SDR. Uh, move up in frequency, what's available in the VHF, UHF and microwaves and SDRs. A very quick review, uh, and I think I finish off that quick review by saying come back tomorrow because it will have all changed again. Because it's an incredibly fast uh, a, a developing area. Um, okay, me. Um, I've spent 40 years of playing. Uh, I started off with um, 8748s and Z80s. Um, I learnt my computer trade in, that, in those areas. And yes, it was assembler. Oh my God. Um, 30 years of amateur radio operator and uh, for most of that time I've spent uh, in IT. Apart from a little foray into geology. Um, I have a passion for recycling and in fact I'll point out that um, some of the stuff that I'll demonstrate in the next break, uh, a lot of it's been put into repurposed cases um, and I, I just can't believe what society throws away. But anyway, um, that's a <laughs> another talk. Um, devotee of open source uh, philosophy and I started my first foray into Unix was FreeBSD 0.1. And I looked after a server that was 0.1 for an awfully long time. Okay, my journey, SDR. Uh, I started off with Softrox. Softrox used the um, sound card as the analog to digital converter. Um, I played in the 630 meter space when we got that, uh, not that long ago. Uh, well before that I had a 40 meter version, so 7 megs. And I also have a, uh, a transceiver, a two meg on ensemble, uh, which is uh, set up for two meters right at the moment, uh, which is USB driven. About 2008, I started to become aware of the high performance software defined radio project. Um, uh, it started in about 2006, and I'll go into that in a sec. Uh, it developed uh, fairly quickly uh, into a single board, uh, which I can show you in the break. Um, and then uh, literally in October, November of last year, there was a con an open source control surface uh, made available using a uh, Raspberry Pi and the Pi 7-inch uh, touch screen, uh, which is called the Pi HP SDR control surface. And there's a couple of different iterations here. Uh, also playing uh, lots of stuff uh, you heard earlier today about the RTL dongles. Um, uh, use a number of them, um, have played in that space. And the big question marks around the Lime SDR is, will I order one or won't I? <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm working on that one. Uh, very nice board though. Very quickly, um, there's a lot of myth around what is a software defined radio. Um, it is digital conversion closest to the antenna no more than one or two stages away from the antenna. Um, it is a wide band radio um, compared to traditional hardware defined radios. Um, and that's defined by your sound card, by the ADC, etc. cetera. Um, the modulation and demodulation is done in software. Um, it is not a hardware uh, a scheme. 
It's controlled digitally, um, and we heard about um, Paul with uh, Hamlib and Rig Control and the various interfaces, the Pi HPSDR. And if you want a new feature or you want to change the filter profile or you want to change the filter, you do it in software. So that's what a software defined radio is all about. Now I'll zoom through the generations because I think it, it, it puts things in perspective. Um, I've put in here generation zero and I, I have to acknowledge here um, a lot of the generation part of this presentation came from a presentation by Howard White uh, which was done in Friedrichshafen and Hamfest last year. They run an SDR academy uh, for a day during that Hamfest uh, in Germany. And he mentioned Generation Zero, <laughs> wideband direct sampling. And if you think back, a spark transmitter was a broadband transmitter and they used a direct sampled crystal receiver to do it. And when I hear that, I'm thinking, hmm, that's a bit like the SDRs, but back in the 1890s. Um, Hardware-defined radio. Um, up until the 1980s had things called digital signal processing. When everyone goes, well, that's an SDR, isn't it? No, that happens to be a way of digitally changing that signal, uh, filtering it, uh, taking out artefacts, whatever you're doing with that particular processing, and then, uh, and then putting it out on your audio channel. That's not SDR. Um, you have problems with hardware-defined radios in every stage of the chain. You uh, mix frequencies together into intermediate frequencies to uh, give you selectivity and sensitivity, etc., etc. And every time you do that, you introduce artefacts of some way, shape or form, which you then have to filter out. So in most um, hardware-defined radios, what you're doing is you're mixing, filtering, mixing, filtering, mixing, filtering, and at each of those stages you are introducing um, distortions, you're introducing artefacts along the way. The goal here is to actually transmit and receive a signal with as fewer artefacts as you, you can introduce and obviously taking into, a, into account your a very variable path, propagation, etc. Okay, generation one. Um, this for ham radio came in around 2000. Coming out of the military applications, um, they were looking at uh, software-defined radios and putting analog to digital converters right at the antenna back with projects like Speakeasy or JTRS back in the 1980s and 90s, but the chips that were, they were using were way out of the reach of amateur radio. Um, they were hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, whereas the uh, the chips these days are anything down to tens of dollars for the equivalent functionality. Direct conversion SDR, so HF uh, to audio frequencies. And we're talking about here the uh, taking a particular frequency, radio frequency that comes in, mixing it down, getting the baseband AF out of it, um, and into a sound card, and if you're, you've got a really good sound card, you can get 192 kilobits per second out of it, or kilohertz, which, uh, surprise, surprise, gives you 192 kilohertz of the band that you're looking at. Um, it's set up so that there's low noise amplifier, there's a filter, a quadrature sampling detector, so it gives you your in phase and out of phase, your I and Q signal. Um, and uh, you then uh, goes into the sound card and the sound card does your analog to digital conversion. Um, the bandwidth is exactly what the sample rate on your sound card is, really easy calculation. Uh, and there's some examples. One of the problems you've got with them though is image rejection. You've got images all up the band and all down the band and so you have to be very careful that you're actually listening to the signal you think you're listening to. <laughs> or you need to be able to filter out the ones that you, you are not the right ones. So um, it relies on the sound card ADC. Now, they're pretty, pretty good usually. Um, and in fact, there's a whole lot of tests being done on them. Um, I went to a Gibbs Tech technical conference a couple of years ago and uh, Glenn English, who knows Glenn, um, has done a whole lot of checks on ADCs in sound cards and he came to the conclusion they were pretty damn good. Um, the pros, so some of the advantages, sound quality is good. 
wide bandwidth and low power. The problems are the images. This is what it looks like. So you've got an antenna into a quadrature sampling detector. Uh, and what you're doing is at the frequency you want, you've got an oscillator at that frequency or a, a digital uh, synthesizer uh, going into uh, a mixer. Uh, it mixes and you grab the audio or the baseband INQ, the in phase and out of phase signals out of that quadrature detector and they go into the left and right of your sound card. So this is generation one SDRs. Still a lot of these around, um, uh, and it relies on the ADC in your sound card. Now my definition of SDR, the demodulation and modulation. When you, once you've got that in phase and out of phase signal, it's really easy to do modulation and demodulation in software. Things like amplitude modulating your I and Q and then summing the output, you get an AM. FM, magnitude of that modulating signal is constant and the frequency varies. It's FM, etc, etc. So it's really easy to actually get that modulation and that demodulation. What does the transmitter look like? Well, it's just the reverse. It is using your sound card for your digital to analog converter into a quadrature sampling uh, in exciter or encoder uh, and out the um, low pass filter on the end there. Um, to filter out some of those, uh, those nasties um, and then out the antenna. Generation two, okay. We remove as many of the analog components uh, between the antenna and the analog to digital converter. So um, what you do is put the ADC almost at the antenna and I'll say almost because there's some issues with doing that. Um, you eliminate as much of that, that uh, analog componentry and you directly sample uh, whatever your ADC is capable of, uh, the signal that's coming in through that antenna. You hear everything and you can get up to things like, and I quote here, 350 million samples per second. And one of the Russian SDRs that is on the, uh, on the market right at the moment that goes all the way up into um, uh, VHF and UHF is sampling at 650 million samples per second. Now that presents you with a data stream that has huge, <laughs> you need, and I make the comment up there, fat pipes. You need gigabit ethernet or you need at least 100 base T ethernet to deal with the amount of data that's coming out of your ADC. Um, and so this is one of the issues, um, and you'll see down the bottom the cons. You need fast PCs to be able to process that amount of data, and you need fat pipes to be able to transfer that data around. Um, uh, okay. Um, and you need, a, obviously, a front end of some sort. And I make note there, Power SDR, um, and I specifically make note of that because it, it was actually... Flex Radio produced um, Power SDR and they made it open source. They actually released it to the market. Um, the advantages, you fix the distortion. You can have a lot of receivers at once if you've got the power. Um, uh, and in fact, the latest in the HP SDR range, which is an Angelina board, you can run seven receivers at once on different frequencies. Um, and bear in mind, on a HP SDR, you're sampling 0 to 60 megs. You are actually sampling 60 megs of bandwidth. Um, and the, the, yeah, the issues are around the fat pipes and fast PCs. The receiver looks like this. The analog to digital converter uh, is almost connected to the, um, the antenna. Now, there is an attenuator in there and a few other things, filters. Um, that are needed to, um, to keep the signal going into the AD, uh, analog to digital converter under control. Digital down converter and then the fat pipe <laughs> into your PC. And your PC does the processing of that stream uh, and gives you uh, audio out the other side. Transmitter looks like the, exactly the same in reverse. Um, it actually has here the USB. Um, in the case of the HP SDR, they've moved away from the USB. It wasn't fast enough. Uh, it was USB 2. Um, and they've moved to Ethernet. Um, 
Okay, generation three. Um, generation three, you basically move the processing power into the radio. So you bring it in via um, a field programmable gate array or you bring the actual PC into the box uh, to do the processing um, and uh, you get over the whole issue of the fat pipe. The fat pipe is within the radio uh, between the computer and the actual uh, SDR. Um, it consists of bandpass filters and attenuators uh, before the ADC and then you've got your processing power and obviously a display of some sort. Uh, some of the examples that are available on the market now, Flex 6000, the NN200 uh, and of course the HP SDR. Um, the advantages, huge dynamic range, low distortion and now that you don't have a fat pipe between your SDR and your computer, you can start to think about remote operation. Remote operation is really advantageous uh, in today's um, uh, world of what I can best describe as RF smog. <laughs> Every device produces some sort of RF uh, and when you've got a super sensitive receiver sitting there in suburbia, uh, you've got to put up with a whole lot of crap <laughs> that's out there. <laughs> I can see some nods. Um, so uh, remote operation is, uh, is of a huge advantage. You put your station out in a, an RF quiet area and you get to it remotely. Um, some of the cons, um, graphical interface um, with a mouse. Um, uh, the contest has started to kick up a little bit and say, well, this is hard to operate through a keyboard or a, or a mouse. So, okay, keep that in mind. What it looks like from a block diagram point of view, low noise amplifier, filter, into the ADC and then there is an FPGA or a fairly powerful computer sitting there and then there is a thin client to whatever your controlling device is, whether that's another computer or another surface. The last generation, so the current generation, it's a generation 3 SDR with knobs. That's how I can best describe it. Um, what they've started to do, and I make the comment there, everything old is new again. We've made it look <laughs> like an old radio. <laughs> We've done it full circle. Um, again, exactly the same arrangement as uh, Generation 3, uh, but uh, you've got a, a probably a more familiar control uh, arrangement with the, the radio. Some of the examples, um, the Italian ELAD, uh, the Russian uh, Sun SDR, which was the one I mentioned earlier, um, and the Flex 6700 and uh, the Maestro control surface. Um, the pros, it looks like a normal radio, That's, and it's easier to drive. Um, the contesters love it. Um, uh, they can see a, a, a full uh, part of the band, and they can click on any signal they can see in the band. Really good. Um, the problems with them, a bit expensive right at the moment, but they're coming down in price. Here's some examples. Um, in the top left hand corner, that's the Flex Maestro. Uh, below that's the ELAD, uh, the Sun SDR is above that, and the HP SDR, which you'll see here. Uh, that's actually a picture of that one, So, uh, which you can play with in the break. Okay, amateur radio. It's a hundred years, actually it's over a hundred years, of international open source hacking. <laughs> it's a bold statement, I know. What, what is amateur radio all about? I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm going to pick up some key bits here. It's experimental. We design, modify, build uh, our equipment. We have, and Ben mentioned this, we have 23 gigahertz of spectrum, if you add it all up, available to us in amateur radio across the whole spectrum. That's a fair bit, um, considering that uh, uh, if you take into account things like mobile phones, uh, small bits of the mobile phone bands uh, were worth a lot of money to governments. <laughs> and we've got 23 gigs of that spectrum spread across the whole lot. Uh, radio communications, we uh, are all about communications. We're seeing that hardware morphing into software hacking. It's not putting hardware blocks together, it's putting software blocks together. Um, it's non-commercial uh, and in a whole range of areas and Ben touched on those. Um, self-improvement, self-education 
and we also provide personnel for emergencies and community service. Now if we contrast that with the HPSDR philosophy, this was a group started back in 2005. In about 2006 there was a group of amateurs from around the world got together and I highlight there Phil Harmon who is from Western Australia who was one of the key drivers in this and one of the key designers. He did a, a fantastic talk at the, uh, the DCC uh, conference a couple of years ago. Um, they got together, uh, they uh, did all the engineering uh, for the HPSDR, they went about balancing cost and performance. At the time the analog to digital converter on the HPSDR little chip on the, the, those boards um, was worth $125. It was the most expensive chip on that board. Now they, they've come down to around $10 these days. So in that short time. But they, they balanced the cost with the performance. They got the best performance they could get out of, out of um, you know, a, a reasonably priced platform. Um, the Tucson Amateur Packet Corporation took it on board. They take bleeding edge projects and they develop them uh, and they marketed it as the next generation SDR for amateur radio. And they also affiliated with the Amateur Satellite Corporation uh, with some, some funding in there. Um, the HPSDR is a generation 2-3 depending on how you look at it. It's a direct up conversion and direct down conversion SDR. It has the ADC next to the antenna. That's the key thing here. Um, and if you have a look at what amateur radio is all about and also the HPSDR open source philosophy, I think they align perfectly. Um, and in recent times, Apache Labs in India have commercialised the product. Um, and in fact, they produced the Pi HPSDR uh, control surface. They also produced the Anon range, which is the HPSDR in uh, its commercial form. Okay, what's it look like in the box? I, I'm not going to go through each of these. There are all the components. Originally, they started off producing each individual component. So there was a receiver board, there was a transmitter board, there was a, a, a GPS disciplined oscillator board, uh, there was the bandpass filters, which are the two at the bottom, uh, that are required, and I'll tell you why they're required in a minute. Now, individual components all on a bus. Um, they then decided that uh, the bus wasn't quick enough, actually wasn't speedy enough, so they went to a single board. Um, and the one on the left is the Hermes board, and the Hermes board is actually in, in this device here. This is the separate components. This is the Hermes board, so the single board uh, version of it. And then uh, Apache Labs produced the Angelina, which is this board here. has a much uh, more powerful FPGA sitting in the middle there. Uh, you can run, if you've got a powerful enough PC, you can run seven receivers simultaneously on different frequencies between 0 and 61 megs on that board. Pretty impressive board. Um, okay, um, John Milton, who is also an amateur in the UK and the US, came up with uh, an open source front end uh, using Warren Pratt's uh, DSP libraries um, and uh, used a Raspberry Pi, originally a 2 and then a 3 and a 7 inch touch screen to give you the control surface which is what you see here. This is the um, Apache Labs version of the control surface and then being an open source uh, arrangement <laughs> I've actually built one into the box here that I used to drive the Hermes board. So it's exactly the same but it's built into the box because it's all open source. And that is in active development right now. <laughs> um, have a look at the, the GitHub for John. Um, and Apache uh, Labs have developed it into a commercial product that they sell with their Anon range. And that's the two there um, that you can see over here. And you're welcome to play with them in the break. There are some issues with this type of uh, software-defined radio. Um, because it is a direct digital conversion and you're listening to 0 to 61 megs of the band. So any signals in 0 to 61 megs um, that can cause uh, the analog to digital converter to overload, you really don't want to be in that space. Because as soon as the ADC starts to overload, uh, you get distortions and all sorts of stuff. 
So that's why you need the filter and the attenuator at the beginning of that chain. Um, as soon as you go into overload, uh, the linearity goes out the window and you, you don't get anywhere near the linearity um, that is quoted there. So you, you have software that is constantly monitoring the input signal and the level of the input signal and adjusting accordingly. Uh, image suppression. Uh, because you're actually receiving uh, 0 to 61 megs, um, there, is, there are signals and artefacts all over the place because they can come from anywhere. Um, and a, an example that I've used there is the uh, FM broadcast band, which is usually pretty strong signals, uh, can appear all over the place, can even appear at 15 to 35 megs, which is down in the region that this, this operates at. So you need to be a little bit aware of that. Um, and that's purely because you're listening to the whole band <laughs> from 0 to 61. Um, PC power, you do need a fair bit of PC power, um, an i5 or an i7 um, and a reasonable graphics card uh, if you wanted to run waterfalls etc. And latency, and I, I make a comment there, um, you do have uh, latency issues with Windows uh, because it isn't. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, if we go up in frequency, this is 0 to 61 megs, so it does cover 6 metres, so it does cover 50 megs, um, which is one of our bands. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, there are other boards available, the soft rock that I mentioned earlier for 2, 4 and 6 metres. Um, there is the MCHF uh, rig uh, that is... Uh, uh, used to control things like the UHF SDR board, which goes from 1.7 to 700 megs. Uh, there is a Tulip SDR, which is a Russian board. Uh, the Hack RF, which you've probably heard about. Uh, the Lime SDR, uh, and I, I make a bit of a comment there. <laughs> it was shipping in November 2016. I'm not sure we've seen them yet, but uh, they're working on it. And the Blade RF, uh, the, the new Blade RF, uh, which was uh, announced a couple of days ago. Um, the software, uh, it's, the hardware has been stable for about three or four years. Um, everybody is now using direct up and down conversion. That is the way to go. Um, uh, the SDR, it's the software component that's actually exploding right at the moment. Uh, Paul, you actually saw this, the SOAPI SDR interface. Standardisation, we're starting to see standardisation of interfacing which is fantastic, um, doesn't, it's platform independent, doesn't matter uh, what sits behind it. Uh, the client server, oh, services, there's the, there's the, the issue <laughs> that I didn't pick up yesterday. Um, client server architectures, I run uh, client servers, I run GHPSDR3, I have three HPSDRs sitting there on the network um, and I can get to any of them <laughs> using whatever client I end up using, whether it's a Pi, whether it's a PC, whether it's a Linux box, etc. So um, it uses a product called QT Radio. One area that's exploding right at the moment is the CUDA SDR area. Uh, it's using the graphics cards to do the DSP, that, that heavy processing, uh, because that's what graphics cards do. Uh, and Phil Harmon, again, is playing in this space. Um, and watch this space because that is, that is an area where you can use a common old garden graphics card to do some pretty heavy duty processing. So um, watch this space. Um, um, Scott mentioned GNU Radio. Um, I have only touched on this and scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> um, but um, I also see it's an incredibly flexible uh, toolkit um, where you put the blocks together into what you want, you put the parameters in for each of those blocks and magically you've got yourself a radio and you can experiment with it, um, which is just fantastic. So uh, this has got to be... And there is a HPSDR block. <laughs> that you can incorporate uh, to interface straight into your HPSDR. So uh, really easy to use. Um, I don't expect you to read all this. This is what's available as a quick review now. 
um, and give you a bit of an idea of the price uh, and where they're available from and where they've come from and they come from all over the world. Um, but as I say in the last dot point, check again tomorrow because it will have changed. The Blade RFX40, uh, which was the update, uh, was, was released a couple of days ago. So, um, uh, etc. The Lime SDR, fascinating history of the Lime SDR because it was uh, put together by a bunch of telco engineers <laughs> to basically be a mobile base station, um, mobile phone base station, cell tower. Um, so absolutely fascinating and really powerful board. What's happening now and in the future? Um, we have, uh, and I'll mention here FreeDV. FreeDV is another open source uh, digital voice. Um, David Rowe, VK5DGR, uh, has done a lot in that space. Uh, he is currently playing with 700 bits per second. <laughs> Um, stream to give you digital voice. Now, I don't know about you, but you can get intelligible voice out of 700 bits per second. <laughs> That's... Uh, sorry? Rivaling single sideband. Well, the 1600 would rival single sideband. The 700, you know, I think he's got a bit of work to do with the 700, but, but to get intelligible voice, um, out of 700 bits per second, you got to be kidding. <laughs> um, uh, just outrageous. And um, the thing about this is uh, the Pi HP SDR surfaces uh, have FreeDV compiled in. They have FreeDV, uh, Radio Mondial, um, PSK, and any other mode that you want to compile in. You want to spend the time and put it in there, uh, then it's available. So just phenomenal. Um, the GPS disciplined oscillators, uh, both of those units have GPS disciplined oscillator inputs, so you have a stable 10 meg input and you can uh, run the weak signal modes very, that need high stability, um, high frequency stability. Um, VHF and above, all of those that I mentioned earlier, um, this is an area where I think uh, the SDR is, ex is going to explode. Um, you will have zero to I don't know, at least a gigahertz, not in, you can get it now. <laughs> you can get it now. Um, uh, the future, the CUDA, um, the remote stations for, to deal with that RF smog. And the web SDRs, actually the web SDRs are here now, it's not really the future. Uh, you go on and put in web SDR uh, into Google and there are uh, tens if not hundreds of web SDRs sitting there that you can listen to uh, and tune remotely. Um, okay, I, uh, I've finished. Um, I'll take some questions if there are any um, and then we'll head into, if you want to come up and have a play uh, and have a look, um, then feel free. So uh, I hope that's been of help. <laughs> I've got this stone look on them. <laughs> anyway, any questions? How much digital signal processing foo do you need to be able to program one of these things? Um, I've had a look uh, and yeah, you need a fair bit. You need to at least to know how to use the libraries. That's the bottom line. Yeah, because it's fairly easy to solder up a filter or something and do the calculations, but when it comes to digital, it comes a lot harder. Um, a lot of the libraries are, um, I understand, quite easy to use. I, I, I admit now I'm not a programmer, guys. <laughs> I'm an amateur radio operator who, who knows enough to be dangerous. Um, and so the, the, as far as I understand, the libraries are reasonably user-friendly. You don't have to know, you know, deep into uh, DSP theory um, to, to be able to use them or play with them. GNU Radio, I think, is a good start because it's done for you. <laughs> um, and there is, some, there is some checking in GNU Radio, so if you put the blocks together that don't go together, it tells you that, hang on, guys, this is, you, you're not going to get this. Um, it's not going to work. So, anyway. All right. Feel free to come up and have a, have a play and have a look at the actual product.
Thanks very much.